Now, it's my honor to introduce a friend of mine, Dr. Stephen Lloyd, who's the chief medical officer at Cedar Recovery. Uh, he uh, trained at Jim Quillen College of Medicine in East Tennessee, and uh, he specializes in internal medicine and addiction medicine. I have the honor to serve with uh, Dr. Lloyd on the Opioid Abatement Council, which he leads with great skill. Uh, he is a nationally recognized speaker and advocate, uh, so I'd like for you to join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Lloyd. Let her rip. I'm uh, physiologically incapable of standing behind that podium uh, for an hour. Uh, so uh, I, I, do, I do talks a lot, and I get nervous before all of them, believe it or not, but today is a little bit different kind of nervous. Um, so I'm going to talk about today a turtle on a fence post. Uh, there's a story behind it. I'm a Tennessean, and, and so it is, uh, it is directly related to Tennessee. It's actually uh, the author Alex Haley's. I didn't make it up. Uh, Alex did, but I use it. Um, but part of my whole thing with a turtle on a fence post is this, and, and I'll just go ahead and show you where it won't make any sense. There's one thing you know for sure when you, you see that, all right? I mean, everybody in the room knows one thing for sure. What's that? All right, didn't climb up there. All right, when you see somebody standing in front of you in recovery, and Jason, and whenever you were, when I met you in Philadelphia and you were talking, this is what you were talking about, all right? We got here, those of us got here in recovery because there is this network of people around this, this community that put us here, all right? And so uh, it's a little bit different than how I normally start my talks because for me, uh, there's a couple people in the room that, that are, are, are my, uh, you know, my folks that support me, that put me here in Williamson County today in front of you all instead of dead 20 years ago. And so back in the early 2000s, uh, I, was a, um, uh, I went to medical school in East Tennessee State University, Johnson City. Uh, Jonesboro is my hometown, so I'm an East Tennessean. And um, on my way home from work one day, uh, life was pretty tough. I was a chief resident at our hospital. Uh, you know, our attendings didn't really, they weren't really around a whole lot back then. We didn't have work hour restrictions. I was struggling with anxiety, depression, work hours. Uh, you know, we were routinely working over 100 hours a week. And I stopped in front of a liquor store in Johnson City, popped open the glove compartment of my truck, and, and there laid some Norcos. Uh, Norco is hydrocodone acetaminophen. Uh, Y'all know them as Vicodin. And I looked at those things, and I said, you know, my patients take these things all the time. Conscious thought. Broke it in half, threw it in my mouth. Within 10 minutes when I got home, suddenly my, wife, my, my job wasn't as bad. Uh, my wife uh, liked my wife a whole lot better, and my kids were better. All right, that was a hell of a 10-minute drive. What I didn't know is the area of your brain uh, that interprets pain doesn't separate physical from emotional pain. I have a long family history of addiction. 18 first cousins on my line. Uh, 17 of us have struggled with addiction. Four of us died before age 40. Um, I have a history of physical and sexual abuse as a child. I had a mother who was uh, physically abusive. Uh, beatings, not, not spankings, not corrections, belts, belt buckles, uh, baseball bats, tobacco sticks. Uh, you name it, me and my sister uh, have been hit with it. And then, of course, the sexual abuse, which I was never uh, going to talk about. And it, it nearly took my life, even years deep into recovery, uh, that started around age four to five and went until I could fight it off. All right, I had no idea that those risk factors lying underneath, uh, you know, all, all of what was going on in my life predisposed me to this little pill that I just took innocently uh, that would say, I'll do anything to get it. And that's exactly what happened to me. So within four years, I was using uh, about 500 milligrams of OxyContin and 8 milligrams of Xanax a day. Now, I wasn't living underneath the bridge, and I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't struggling for a job. I was the number one producer in our medical practices back in East Tennessee. Uh, I'd won teaching award after teaching award at our medical school, which gets me uh, to my point of starting off this way, because there was a group of kids that came into medical school back then, and Andy doesn't know this, and he's getting ready to find it out. So one of your presenters earlier here today was Andy Russell. Andy is the chief medical officer here um, in Williamson County. I'm so proud of Andy, but back in the day, before he had gray hair, he was, uh, he was one of my students. And Andy was in that group that when they came into med school, I was using. So they knew me before and after. And so back then, I was all about me. You know, I'll do what I want to. I won't answer emails. If you want to talk to me, you can come see me. I made everybody's life around me miserable. I really did. And, and Andy was in, in a class coming through there. And I went in the first year, and I gave a lecture to the class. 
And um, Andy, this is what I called Chad about this morning, one of, one of Andy's buddies. And um, I gave a lecture to the class. I never bothered to read the reviews because I knew I was good. So they were going to review me well, right? Uh, I don't know, that sounds so terrible, but it is so true. Uh, not the part about being good, but that's what I thought. And so I never read the reviews from that class that I went and did. And then, you know, I go on through my addiction. I go and I get treatment and I come back. And one of the things I wanted to do was clean up all my mess from before. And so I sat down at my computer at night. Now these kids are in their third year of med school. And uh, I start going through my emails. And guys, I had thousands and thousands and thousands of emails. And I went through every one of them at night after work, just picked off so many each night. And I clicked on the one from Andy's class from back then. And some of the comments were, I can't believe this guy's a doctor. Um, sure hope I don't turn out like him, right? And I'm sitting there and it's dark outside and I'm crying and they're, and they're all off on clinical rotations now. And so they don't get together anymore. Next time they all get together as one class, it'll be graduation. And so I, uh, I, uh, had it, had them on third year rotations now, right? Two years later. And we had our award ceremony coming up for teachers and all that stuff. And, and so I sat down and I just typed an email and I said, Hey guys, you know, Steve Lloyd here. I'm finally reading my reviews from two years ago. And I don't know if you remember getting this email from me or not, Andy, but I said, uh, you were right. And I'm sorry, I, I let you down. And I sent it out to the students. Well, we go to the award ceremony for third year rotations in that same class. Uh, voted me the, the best teacher on the internal medicine rotation. And, and the young one of Andy's classmates who gave me the award whispered in my ear. She said, we got your email. I didn't even realize that was you. And that's how much it can change, guys. And I tell you that story for a lot of reasons. First one is, Andy, I'm sorry. I told Chad that this morning. I feel like I let you all bound back then. And uh, I'm proud of you, proud of what you've done, uh, despite me. Um, and then the other part of it is, is that if we intervene and we help somebody, just one or two years down the road, you don't even recognize them, right? You said this, right? Your children will never know that. And that's what I'm here for uh, today. So Andy, thanks for being here. Uh, when you get to be 50 years old, you don't think God's going to drop people in your life, you know, like he did when you're early on and they're going to be so meaningful to you. And three years ago, God dropped Ken Moore in my life. Uh, we got appointed to the opiate abatement council. I'm looking down through there. Surely there's another doctor somewhere. I get doctor and I look over at his profession and he's a dead gum mayor. I was like, what in the world's going on here? And, uh, and so he sits beside me in one of our first council meetings and I start listening to him and I went, oh my gosh, I want to be like him. And so I was smart enough to recognize that and he has been a mentor of mine. So thanks for having me, uh, Dr. Moore. So to get back to my turtle on the fence post story, uh, the turtle on the fence post actually came from Alex Haley. And when you see somebody that's in recovery, and, and really I could make this argument for any of us, but since we're talking about addiction, I'll use recovery. Uh, when you see somebody in recovery, they didn't get there by themselves and, and I'm no different. But I'm gonna tell you several stories as we go through this because I wanna point out the disparities in care that we have in the United States. And I realize where I'm standing right now. I'm standing in Williamson County. This is the most affluent county in the state of Tennessee. Uh, we, uh, I live in Wilson County, which is second, and we are a distant second. Okay, I think I saw where uh, Williamson County is like the seventh most affluent county in the United States. I'm pretty sure that's true. Yet you are not immune because I know audience members out there who have lost their children to this disease. So nobody, uh, nobody is, is immune to that. But it's about community and relationship and it's what you have here and I think it's what, what, what we can build on uh, with regards to helping people go forward. So when I got, when I, uh, got intervened on, I got intervened on by my dad. Uh, I had taken my son down to go hiking with my dad and I told you how many pills I was using. I used to just carry them in the, in the, glo in the cup holder of my truck. I didn't care who saw them. All right, I mean, that's just where I was. And so I took my son down to, to meet my dad to, to go hiking the next day. And my dad was right here in the window of my truck. My son walked around the front. I can still see in my mind's eye them walking off. And I reached over and I grabbed 15 10 milligram Percocets. That's oxycodone. That is uh, for 150 morphine equivalents. Threw them in my mouth. And when I turned around, my dad was standing right there. He looked at me and he says, Steve, he said, did you just take a handful of pills? What'd I tell him? No. Now, hell, he just saw me, right? I said, no. He said, okay. He turned around and walked off. When I got home from work the next day, I turned the corner, looked up on the hill at my house, and I saw Dad's truck sitting there, and I knew what he was there for. I knew it. I knew it from a half a mile away. 
I got up there and he said, Steve, we're going to go see your sister. I said, Dad, I don't want to go. I'm tired. He said, get in the truck and let's go. And I said, all right. So we headed up the road. Uh, he looked over at me and he said, Steve, he said, you have a drug problem. I said, no, Daddy, I'm tired. I was paying back med school loans, working two or three jobs, doing all the things I was doing. And went about another two, three miles up the road and Daddy was crying. He put his hand over on my knee and he said, Steve, he said, you got a drug problem. That was not a question. And I said, yeah, Daddy, I do. I said, I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my medical license. I'm going to lose everything I worked my whole life for. And he said, well, he said, none of that stuff is going to do you any good if you're dead. And guys, I, it's been 20 plus years, and I, I don't have a retort to that to this day. And he was right. Luckily, in the state of Tennessee, we have something called the Tennessee Medical Foundation. Uh, it is right here in Williamson County. And a guy named Roland Gray, I called. And uh, Roland uh, was kind to me, and he loved me. He told me that you're going to be okay. He said, you're going to need to go to treatment. He said, you'll be gone at least three months. I was sitting there. I'm really smart. There'll be a test. I'll be gone three weeks. So I packed my bags for three weeks and came to Nashville, and I was here for about four months. Uh, I had to send for some clothes. But there were several things that happened here in Nashville that I've never gotten over, and it's driven my work to this day. And this is the biggest one that I'm getting ready to tell you. So I, they took one look at me, a guy named Chip Dodd at CPE. Took one, looked at me and said, uh, son, you need to go to detox. I didn't know what detox was. Now, keep in mind, I've been to medical school and residency. I didn't have any idea what detox was. And uh, so they put me in the back of this long BMW. I couldn't even you know, stick my feet out and hit, the, hit the, you know, the seat in front of me. It was a long one. And we got down to Vanderbilt, and they put me on a floor in Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt Institute for Treatment of Addiction, started by a guy named Andy Spickard, who became a great friend of mine uh, later on. I didn't know any of that at the time. There were 24 kids on my floor. Okay, I thought we would all go from that detox unit to a treatment center. We were part of the same program. Nobody knew I was a doctor. Uh, do you all know how many people got to leave there after five days and go to a detox, to go to a treatment center? One, you're looking at him. And I hear people say all the time about folks in addiction, they got to want it bad enough. They got to find their bottom. If they don't want it, then it's their fault. No other disease in medicine do we do that. I can make that argument about diabetes all day long. Stop eating chocolate cake and drinking Mountain Dew Code Reds, okay? But we don't do that. But we do it with addiction all the time. And, and so uh, it was, it's interesting to me because none of the other kids in there, and I was 37. The rest of these kids are 19, 20, 21 years old. I mean, they are kids. And I would hear them sit around at night talking if one of them was getting out the next day. And they would try to come up with a symptom where they could stay one more day. And then you're on the outside are going to say you don't want it bad enough. And guys, my world started to change right then, and I was still shaking. And I started to see there are two systems of care here. There's a system of care for people like me who have a medical license and rolling gray in my corner. And then there's a system of care that these kids are stepping into, and we're going to kill them. And we have. And we've killed them for over 20 years. And I'm here today to tell you we need to stop killing them because we got some money. And we got some ideas, and I think we got some people who care, and I think recovery is actually a movement now. And I think that we can capitalize on it. The little girl that was in the room next to me uh, was 19 years old. She was a prostitute in Printer's Alley. She had whelps up and down her arms from, from abscesses. She had HIV disease and hep C. And uh, the day before I left, she was going to be there for another couple of days. I gave her my pillow. I had the only real pillow in the whole place. My college roommate brought me a real pillow. I used to thought I needed a big car. I needed a dadgum pillow is what I needed. Uh, if I ever write a book, that's chapter one. Um, I gave her my pillow. She went back in her room. She came out and she had a picture. She said, Steve, I wanted you to see me when I was clean. Her words, not mine. And she showed me a picture of her junior prom, uh, Mount Juliet High School, where I now live. And that's what she wanted me to see. And she stepped out of there after five days and went back to the street because she didn't have the resources I had. And I haven't gotten over it. I stepped into a system of care with Roland Gray and the people of the Tennessee Medical Foundation that put me here today. I have lived a life that I would have never dreamed of. And it's, guys, it's not an accident. It's actually accessible for everybody if we're willing to do it. All right. Can you help me? <laughs> Yeah just, just, yeah, just advance it. It's okay. I don't have very many slides, and you all will love this uh, because uh, <laughs> you ever get to a, a talk and you look down the corner, it says slide one of 87. You're right. <laughs> you know, the pucker factor goes sky high. Um, uh, I have like 10 slides, and all of them are pictures. I think, I think this is the only one that has words on it, so you're, you're, you're in luck. 107, 622. Does anybody know what that number is? 
It's the number of Americans we lost to drug overdose in 2020. Now, I know we've got updated numbers, but I'm going to give you one of the 107-622 because there's a mass murderer out there who I will not name uh, who has a quote that's very useful for what we're dealing with right now. And he said that one death is a tragedy. A million deaths are a statistic. If we're not careful, we will start treating this uh, like a statistic. Behind every one of those 107-622 is a human being. And I'm going to show you one of them, and that's why I use the number for, uh, from 2020. So let's look at that number for a second. That number is equivalent to a 747 airplane crashing and burning, killing everybody on board, uh, everybody on board around the clock, uh, sorry, every 36 hours around the clock for a year. That's that number. If that was happening, none of us would fly. Yet it, you almost never hear anything about it. Why? Because they don't happen all at once, and they happen in kids' bedrooms. Right, mommy's doing CPR in in, in a kid's bedroom on in, in in the bed that the kid grew up in. Right, there's a list of things mommy shouldn't have to do. That's got to be really high on it. Right, they happen in hotel rooms. They happen on street corners, underneath the bridge. Right, and then the kid dies, and they send a paper, and they die of natural causes. How many 22 year olds have natural causes? Right, why do they say that? Because they say that because of stigma. Because I don't want anybody to know. They'll think less of them, this, that. And we had a group of mommies here in, in Williamson County that actually bucked that. And they actually wrote it in the obituary and said, my kid lost their battle with addiction. And I had to find them mommies because that's what we got to have. We got to have somebody willing to step forward so that other people out there who are, who are hurting will have some hope. And it's about community and relationship, the turtle on the fence post thing. So every system is designed perfectly to get the results that it gets. You can talk about us doing this, us doing that. I'm a huge football fan. Bill Parcells said, you are what your record says you are. That's our record. We're 107-622. So I teach addiction as a slot machine, all right? And, and our, I don't know if y'all heard the Department of Homeland Security guy earlier. He was awesome, all right? I, I helped him a little bit with his neuroscience. I'm going to make him even better. Uh, he is, a, but he's an incredible speaker. But he touched on this a little bit. We're going to talk about it right now. So addiction, I start, I'm self-taught. I went to conferences all over the country. I went to research conferences. I had egghead PhDs, you know, with all these charts and graphs and arrows going everywhere. And I'm sitting there thinking, how in the world am I going to teach that in the Rutherford County Jail? I can't. So I had to come up with something that I could teach at Vanderbilt or I could teach in jail. And so I came up with a slot machine. Addiction is something called the biopsychosocial model. It makes me want to vomit a little bit even saying it. All right. What it really is is a slot machine. When the three sevens are come down on the pay line, that's when the money comes out the bottom. All right. The first seven, bio, it's genetics. 60% of addiction is genetics. All right. How do we figure out somebody's risk? Ask them their family history. You could ask them their own history. Most people won't tell you the truth. Right, because of shame and stigma. I tell people all the time, the most I've ever had anybody admit to drinking is two. I don't care how drunk they were, they only had two. <laughs> right? So I get away from that. Almost everybody will talk about family members. If you have a positive family history of addiction, your first seven is on the pay line. The second seven is the psycho component of the biopsychosocial model. And it's simply this what kind of household were you raised in? Right? None of us came out of a normal household, they don't exist. But some of us came out of worse places than others. Physical, sexual, emotional abuse. Big T traumas. Because we learn nothing about this in medical school. We learn nothing about the proper prescribing controlled substances for acute and chronic pain. We learn nothing about addiction. We learn nothing about risk factors for it. We learn absolutely nothing about the role of chronic trauma on our lives. Right? The ACEs study, Adverse Childhood Experiences. I'll argue it's the second most important study done in the history of medicine. And I don't know of a medical school in the United States that teaches it. And it says this, it says when your ACEs score gets to a four or above, your risk of just about everything goes straight up. Real diseases like hypertension, diabetes, right, substance use issues, right, yet we never talk about it and it is absolutely driving so many of these things out there. And we're never going to address the problem of addiction and mental health issues until we start, or until we're willing to address trauma. And we've got some wonderful places in Tennessee that actually do that. One of the best places in the world on site, right, in Cumberland Furnace, Tennessee. Look at and, and getting at this, and it's just so important, and, and it's really, you know, I, I want to get to the point where people understand the importance of it and more people have access to it because it is the thing that allowed me to start to talk about the sexual abuse. I want to stop right here for a second because I got time. I want to tell you that when I came through treatment, I didn't, I didn't touch the sexual abuse thing, right? I wasn't going there. And guys, I stayed in recovery for 10 or 12 years. I was doing great. I was chief of medicine at my hospital. My career's going straight up. I never talked about the sexual abuse because that happened a long time ago. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, all the things that we tell ourselves. I was coming from Cookville to Nashville, and I was almost 50 years old. And I started having PTSD symptoms. I never had one in my life. 
Never had one in my life. I started having flashbacks of the beatings. I started having flashbacks of the sexual abuse. I called my sister. I was crying on the side of the road. And she said, Steve, I take medicine for it. You're going to have to see a psychiatrist. I said, well, that's not happening. Within a couple of months, I wound up on the edge of my bed uh, looking down the wrong end of a 45. And I tell you that to tell you that I would have been much better off taking a pill, right? I'd have had a chance there. If I pull the, hammer, uh, pull the trigger on the 45, I'm a dead man. And I remember having that gun up to my head, and I remember two things. One, I got worried about who was going to find me. And, and two, I, I, uh, I remembered to ask for help. Back in treatment, they said, ask for help. And I laid, I laid the gun down. I called Mike Barron, uh, who took Roland Gray's job at the TMF. And, and Mike sent me to on-site. And, and I got to spend, uh, I, I spent four weeks there. And by the time I was done, I asked him, could I stay another two weeks? And so I spent six weeks at on-site, and I got to work on the thing that had really uh, been, uh, you know, the, the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life. And, and what it did for me, it didn't get rid of it, but it's not the boogeyman in the closet anymore. I can talk about it without that fight, flight, freeze, or appease response. And so I take care of drug-dependent pregnant women. I'm going to show you one here in a second. And I almost hate knowing that treatment exists. Why? My girls will never have access to it. $50,000 cash. I had it. Got lucky. My girls don't have it. I think about it all the time. I think about that girl back in the detox unit all the time. I think about the systems of care that we have. And I can't get over it. And so, Dr. Moore, when you see me in our meetings sometimes, and I know you watch my blood level go up, I can't get that out of my mind. Because, guys, when you, when you see it, you can't unsee it. Right? I used to think everybody lived in my neighborhood. Everybody had this degree. This, this is what we do. That ain't the real world. That's not what my patients are up against, and it's not what my pregnant girls are up against. And so w places like that, you know, and, and I know Miles, right? Miles runs, runs, uh, you know, runs on site. How about scholarship and a couple of these girls a year, right? How about that? You know, give them a chance at what I got a chance at because it's so important, and I get to live my life like I get to live it right now. So that's second seven. What's the third seven? What's widely available and socially acceptable? Okay, what's the most widely available, socially acceptable things people have trouble with, right? Alcohol. Get it anywhere. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, the pharmaceutical industry started to downplay, uh, downplay the, the, the dangers of, uh, of opioid pain medication. So if you have a long-acting medication rather than a short-acting medication, people will be less likely to get addicted to it. There's absolutely no clinical science in that whatsoever. Yet that wording actually got put in the package insert via the FDA, which is supposed to protect us from marketing, uh, which actually didn't. And the person who was responsible for that later went to work for Purdue Pharma, uh, of course, the makers of OxyContin. And so there's a lot of people to point fingers at here. But you had these pain societies pop up and says, we're not scared. We're, you know, we're too scared of opioids that, uh, <laughs> we're too scared of opioids that, you know, we're, we're hurting people but not treating their chronic pain. And, and that we need to, you know, it needs to be more widely available. There's, only, there's less than a 1% chance of addiction. So say studies in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I'm going to show you in a little bit why that's a fallacy. It's not a study at all. And it's actually why you see uh, the industry losing, uh, the lawsuits are losing right now. So when the three sevens come down on the pay line, that's when the money comes out the bottom. Genetics, trauma, opportunity. It's as easy as that. So when I'm out educating prescribers right now, I can go through all 55 pages of the chronic pain guidelines recommendation, and nobody's going to do that. What I can do is teach them how to screen for the family history, teach them how to screen a little bit for the trauma, and then give them some ideas on how to help people run to them rather than away from them. Because what we do is we don't do any of that. I'm sorry, you're sitting on the front row. What's your name? Zanny. All right, gosh. Zanny, I'll never remember. I Zanny. So Zanny breaks her leg. She comes into me, right? She's, going to, she's got her broken femur. She's going to need some pain medication. I'm sitting there as the provider. How do I know that I'm not getting ready to chuck a match on a tinderbox? Right? How do I risk stratify? Our, our, our doctors don't know. I mean, Dr. Moore didn't know. I don't know. None of us do. Right? Andy, none of us. Right, so what I teach them is, okay, use a slot machine. Get into their family history. Find out what their family history is. If it's positive, then they're at elevated risk. You can actually get into, their, into the psycho part of this as well. What kind of home did you grow up in? Right? And, and that's not a hard thing to get into. And if both those things are positive, then you've got to let your patient know they're at increased risk. And you want to try to build a relationship so if they, if they get in trouble later on, they run to you rather than away from you. We don't do any of that. Right, what do we do? We write her a prescription for 90 oxycodone. She needs 14. 
Okay, so why do we write her 90? Anybody know? There's a real good reason. So you won't call back. That's why. Okay, and then by the time she's had 90, she's past the point where you become dependent on it. Dependent means when you stop taking it, you get sick. It ain't addiction. It's dependence. I can do it to anybody in the room. And now she's got some issues. And if she's got any of those risk factors that I talked about earlier, now she's at markedly increased risk of developing addiction. It, guys, addiction is continued use despite consequences. Right now she's at risk for that. So she goes out and, and her leg gets better. She stops taking the pain medication, but she's been dragging this chronic trauma around with her her whole life. And a couple of weeks after her leg gets better, she goes, golly, I felt better on the pain medication. Maybe my leg hurts a little more than I thought it did. It's called somatization. It doesn't mean she's a bad person. We all do it, right? You have a bad day at work, your back hurts, your head hurts, right? Same thing. And so she goes and gets another prescription. When she gets that second prescription, there's a 70% chance she's still on the medication a year later. And now we're in trouble. And now she needs increasing dosages, right, for less and less effect. And she goes to multiple doctors. And then if she ever goes back to the original doctor and he pulls it up, well, let me look at it. Here's the control substance monitoring data bank. You've been going to five doctors and 14 pharmacies. What does the doctor do? Kicked her out. She's addicted. She goes to the street, and now she buys heroin and fentanyl. She dies. Because that's what happens. 70% of the people who are using heroin and fentanyl today started on prescription pain medication, yet we still don't teach what I just taught you guys in about five minutes in any medical school in the country that I can think of. And it's a shame. Next slide. That's okay. I can do it. Yeah, sit down. Yep. All right, so if you want to be scared of something, be scared of this. Right. This uh, this looks like a Percocet. This is actually bought way back in 2016 at the Avenues in Murfreesboro uh, by an undercover TBI agent. And uh, this is oxycodone. Percocet is oxycodone acetaminophen. Oxycodone is 1.5 morphine equivalent. That means that one milligram of oxycodone equals 1.5 milligrams of morphine. Only this is not oxycodone. It's carfentanil. I can pick this one out. See those things? All right, they shouldn't be, though. There's impurities. I can pick those out. I don't know if the regular person on the street can pick those out, but that's back in 2016. So I'm a huge Breaking Bad fan. I love Breaking Bad. All right, and, and if y'all, anybody saw Breaking Bad, like when Walt and Jesse first start cooking meth, they're cooking it out in a Winnebago in the desert. And then they meet Gus Fring, and Gus Fring takes them to an underground pharmaceutical lab, and they start cranking out some high-quality meth. Same thing's happening here, guys. Back in 2016, people were using basically stuff uh, to make pills, by taking powder uh, fentanyl from China, pressing it into pills that looked just like what comes out of the pharmacy, right? And they were doing it basically with stuff you buy at Home Depot and Lowe's. The latest machines that I've seen from the, that the TBI has seized actually came out of Jackson, Tennessee, in their pill presses that are pharmaceutical grade that put out thousands of pills an hour that I can't see. You say, well, what does that matter? This is carfentanil rather than oxycodone. I told you oxycodone is 1.5 morphine equivalent. Carfentanil is 10,000 morphine equivalents. You take this one and you die. Okay? It's as simple as that. I've got people out there that, you know, that talk about, you know, uh, you know, go back out and do some experimentation. I see this in 12-step groups. Well, you hadn't had enough. Go back out there and experiment some more. Please don't do that. You will die. And please stop telling people to do that. This is not alcohol. You don't have to use this for 30 years to die. Use this this afternoon and you'll die. And guys, it's why I love medication. I talk about buprenorphine. I talk about methadone. Why do I talk about it? Because it keeps kids alive and I'm tired of them dying. If I can keep them alive long enough, I can get to those underlying drivers of addiction and we can get to the things that are driving them there in the first place and we can start to address their underlying mental health issues and now maybe we can move forward. Yet I've got communities all around, and any time you want to come somewhere and put a clinic in that's going to use medication, by gosh, you're not going to do it here. You're going to do it over there. And the stuff that they say is unbelievable. And then they'll turn around to the audience and say, who out there is for this? You tell me this. When the whole community out there has the torches, who's going to raise their hand? Nobody. Nobody. I raise mine because I ain't scared of them. And I will go in situations like that, and I'll get texts from people in the audience. Thank you for doing that. I work for the county. They'd l I'd lose my job if they knew. Guys, we have got to get rid of that. We're never going to get anywhere as long as stigma is preventing people from getting help. If you want to be scared about something for your kids, be scared about that. Uh, I wanted to show you this slide. I usually like to do this when you're eating. Uh, so uh, several years ago, uh, I opened a methadone clinic in Cock County, Tennessee. Guys, I don't know the first thing about methadone. Nothing. 
I know nothing. I had a judge up there, a unicorn. His name was Dwayne Sloan. And unfortunately, Judge Sloan passed away in, in August of this year, and he's a dear friend. But he was a unicorn, and he saw these people coming in his drug court, and they kept dying, and they kept dying, and he knew that medication had a role, and I met him, and so I started sitting on his drug court, and I started treating his patients, and our patients did really, really well, and he wanted all three forms of medications. There's three. There's methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone, and he wanted all three forms in his judicial district, so I opened a clinic in Newport, Tennessee. Newport is Cock County. It's the last county you go in on I-40 after you pass Sevierville over into North Carolina. We got flooded recently, uh, really, really badly. And fortunately, we didn't lose any of our patients, but our community uh, suffered greatly. So Cock County is famous for two things. Uh, they're famous for moonshine. Popcorn Sutton was from Cock County. And they're famous for fighting roosters, okay? The name of the high school is the Fighting Cocks. So uh, I opened up my clinic. So the first 200 patients we had there, I saw all of them, and I would go in, and I would take their history. I know how to take a history. And I'd say, hang on a second. I'd go in the back. I'd flip open TIP 63, which is a treatment improvement protocol, which teaches how to use methadone. And I'd sit there and read, and I would come back in and treat my patients. So when your doctor says he's going to the bathroom, don't always buy that. All right. And so I loved it. I loved it. And I love my patience. This is patient number four. Guys, I've been doing this a while. This morning, I'm responsible for the care of about 3,200 people with opioid use disorder this morning. All right. And, and I've seen a few things. So when I do my physical, I'm looking around. I know women like to shoot subclavian underneath their collarbones. They shoot underneath rings, watch bands between their toes, right? Under, everywhere, right? Genitalia, groin. I never thought to look on her shin. Never dawned on me. So I had her for about two weeks, and she said, Dr. Lloyd, I need to show you something. We go back in my office and pull her pant leg up, and this is what I see. You don't have to be a doctor to know that this needs to be in the hospital. You can almost see her bone, right? I said, honey, you need to be in, in the hospital, right? You need to be getting IV antibiotics. She said, so I was in the hospital getting IV antibiotics. She was in a large academic institution in East Tennessee, which I will not name. And she was getting IV antibiotics. She is injecting four to five grams not milligrams, grams of heroin and fentanyl a day. I told you all I was using 100 Vicodin a day. Some of you's mouth dropped open, right? She's using 10 times that. She has an 11-year-old son that she does not have custody of. Does she need custody of her 11-year-old son? No, she doesn't. Does she deserve an opportunity to get her son back? Yes, in my world, she does. And so I said, we've got to, you know, what, what happened? Well, what happened to her after she had been there for 24 hours? Anybody? She got dope sick, right? And the hospital doesn't know how to handle her dope sickness, which is really remarkable because it's not rocket science. And she starts pulling in her IVs. How did the hospital respond? Kicked her out. She goes back to the street. She's injecting. I said, honey, we got to get you back on antibiotics. She says, I'm on antibiotics. I said, bring them in tomorrow. She brought them in the next day. Sure enough, she was on antibiotics. She was on clindamycin, which is not a bad antibiotic for what she had. Only it wasn't from a pharmacy. It was in a box this big. It was blue, and it had fish on it. It was for guppies. She had Googled skin infection. She Googled antibiotic for skin infection and figured out she could buy it at the health food store without having to put up with the shame of the healthcare system that she was stepping into. Guys, you look at me like I'm crazy, and I'm telling you this is happening today. It's happening today. Uh, hopefully it's not happening in this county. Chances are it is somewhere, though. Okay, we live in the richest country in the United States, and the, our, in the United States, the richest country in the world, not even a close second. And this is the healthcare system that our patient stepped into. Got her on the, uh, got her on the four dollar Walmart list. To, uh, two antibiotics. This cleared up in about twelve weeks. She's got her second supervised day of visitation with her son. That's a good thing. Does she need her son back yet? No. She's got other things that we have to help her with social determinants of how stable housing, income, things that you need to take care of a kid. But we're giving her a pathway back. And that's okay. Next slide. Um, when I started in addiction medicine back in the day, I'm an internist. Uh, there were two groups of people I looked at. I looked at the incarcerated population, and I looked at pregnant women. And back then, uh, in the South, uh, we believed in locking you up and throwing away the keys, so I knew I wasn't going to get any worth the incarcerated pro, uh, people, so went after pregnant women. And I would go to conference after conference, and they would talk about pregnant women, and it was the nastiest stuff you've ever heard. These women are this, they're that. We need to take their babies, throw them in jail. I mean, it was unbelievable the things that I heard. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm scared to meet these women. And I raised my hand at one of them. I said, what are we doing to help them? This is a treatment conference. You know what we're doing to help them? Nothing. We don't take them. You know why we don't take them? Because a baby can sue you until they're 19 years old. Okay, if, if, I, if I have malpractice on you, you got a year. 
right? If you're a baby born to you, you got 18 years plus a year, 19 years. So we don't treat them because of liability. And I thought that that was crazy. And so I started learning how to treat pregnant women. Guys, when I was in medical school, the last two things I wanted to be, in the third, third year, you kind of rank your list of what you want to be growing up. And I had mine down at the bottom. I had OBGYN. I damn sure didn't want to do that. I tell people the placenta used to hit me in the back of the head. I couldn't wait to get out of the room. All right. And I didn't want to see it, be a psychiatrist. I didn't want to you know, put people on medication and sit around and pontificate. I didn't want to do either one of those two things. And it turns out that, that I love treating drug-dependent pregnant women. Most fun I've ever had in my life. Uh, my women are strong. They're resilient. I'll put them up against anybody. Um, I left the Haslam administration in 2018. Went back out into the private world. I went to work for Journey Pure in Murfreesboro. And I went there for one reason. They were going to allow me to start a treatment program for pregnant women. And you're looking at the second one. Her name is Brooke. Uh, she's from a state about seven hours away from Tennessee. Brooke is 25 years old. I have treated thousands and thousands of patients now with addiction. That's the toughest patient that I've ever had. Uh, I knew Brooke for two weeks before she called me anything other than mf -er. And Brooke was not using the initials, okay? I remember I walked in one morning. She was in her house, and I said, good morning, Brooke. She said, good morning, Dr. Lloyd. I thought, okay. Why was she doing that? She wanted to see if I was going to run. I don't run. I don't get scared by that because I know where she is. So Brooke uh, is 25. She figures out she's eight weeks pregnant. Pregnancy is 40 weeks. She's using IV methamphetamine. I'm sorry. She's using IV fentanyl, uh, IV heroin, and one other drug. I just told you methamphetamine. You should be able to pick that out from the marks, right? The marks. Methamphetamine is made out of stuff you get at Home Depot and Lowe's. It's got a bunch of impurities in it. You pick at your skin. So this is methamphetamine. She goes to her mom says, I don't want to live like this anymore. Brooke is a certified welder. Okay, I told you she's tough, a 25-year-old woman who's a certified welder, but she can't get a job as a certified welder because she has two felonies. Her felonies are for possession with intent to resell, only Brooke is not a dope dealer. Guys, the fentanyl these kids are using, their tolerances are getting so high, the amount of drug they have to have on them themselves to keep themselves out of withdrawals is enough to tip the scale for possession for intent to resell. And when you hang a felony on a kid, they can't get a job. We've got to start to look at that. And Brooke had a public defender, and I'm not knocking public defenders. I love public defenders. But if this is my daughter, Haley, she doesn't have a sticky note on her, on her file. I'll guarantee it because I can afford for her not to. System of care is not equal, guys, and I thought it was, and it's just not. So Brooke's mom calls me up. Uh, I said, yes, bring her. And they brought her to Murfreesboro. I met her about seven hours after this picture is taken. Next slide. So I love pregnant women for a lot of reasons. One is you can scare the heck out of insurance companies with them. And so I scared the insurance company for a long time, and I got to keep Brooke for a long time. This picture uh, is she's 38 weeks. She's got two weeks before delivery. Uh, she's turning 26. What happens when you turn 26? You lose mom and dad's insurance, so she's going to go back on her home state's Medicaid. And she says, Dr. Lloyd, I want to go back to my home state. What's back in her home state? Something called a baby daddy. Now, guys, I had no clue what a baby daddy was. I used to, I, I, none. I don't live in that world. And you know how when you don't tell somebody you don't know something and you go on a long time, now you can't ask them? That was me. I did that. And then my kids told me about this app on my phone called Urban Dictionary. And so I looked it up in Urban Dictionary, and I know what a baby daddy is. Brooke's baby daddy has been in prison for drugs. I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to tell you why we can't kill our way out of this. Because there's a, lot, there's a group of people out there that says, hey, we can kill our way out of this. Let enough of these people die. We'll get them out of the gene pool. All right? Here's the flaw in that argument. That child has not been born yet. Let's go back to my slot machine and my risk factors. What's my first one? Genetics. What's that baby's genetics? Mom and dad. Ain't drawn a breath yet, already at elevated risk. You cannot kill your way out of it. Hang on for the second seven. That's coming. You can't kill your way out of it. We don't live in a vacuum, guys. So Brooke wants to go back. She's going to have her state's Medicaid. And oh, by the way, she's not going to have me. Guys, I'm an average doctor at best. I promise you I am. But I care. I care a lot. And Brooke don't have me. She's got a doctor who's not going to take her Medicaid. And he's going to charge her $125 a week just to write her medication. Brooke has an underlying mental health, two underlying mental health conditions. She has bipolar and PTSD. Okay, and she has a trauma history that my Sunday school class don't want to know about. All right, 
and we're getting her help for all that. She goes back to Ohio. All that goes away, and she can't get a job as a certified welder, so she works at a convenience mart making minimum wage and giving all of that to the doctor simply to write a medication without any underlying help. And that's the system of care that my Brooke went back to. Next slide. I love this slide. It's one of my favorites. Brooke and her mom, Angie, sent me this from the delivery suite. I want you to look at Brooke right there. Go back two slides. Can you go back? Okay, now forward two. 38 weeks. That's it. Unrecognizable. Brooke is a dime. Y'all know what a dime is? That is a 10. Brooke is a 10. Guys, I get to see this every day. I've got pictures on my phone from, from mamas I've helped years and years ago. First mama I ever helped her kid just got her driver's license. I got them all over my phone. This is the most fun I've ever had in medicine, and these are from the patients that they told me were the worst people I was ever going to meet. I'm going to stop listening to people, all right, because they just ain't right. Next slide. Brooke had her first picture made with Ava. She wanted to be a good mom, but Brooke's struggling. All the money she's making is going directly to a doctor who's not helping her with any, any of her underlying stuff. She relapses, and she gets chunked in jail. Let's leave her right there. Next slide. You recognize the character on the right? I really like this picture for a lot of reasons. One of the uh, reason I always have a hat on, I'm bald. Uh, I still hadn't gotten over it, so I wear a hat. I don't care where I am, and I don't care what Dr. Frist wore. Uh, uh, so uh, that's me with hair. So I had a problem with alcohol growing up, always. I never knew when to stop. I was not a good drinker at all. I, went, I go to medical school. The first day I meet my med school classmates, they're the most impressive group of people I've ever met in my life. I love all of them to this day. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. I saw their academic records, and I was like, oh, my goodness. I, I drank beer at four, for four years at UT and chased girls, and I'm in big trouble. I didn't catch any, but I, I chased a bunch. And I thought, I'm, I'm not going to do well here. And uh, the second day of, of school, they elected me their class president. And I couldn't let them see me drink. I couldn't let them see me be a drunk. And I didn't. I didn't drink for four years. And then this day happened. Graduation. They went to the four corners of the earth. I was drinking again in about two weeks, and I was using pills in uh, a little over a year from, from the date this picture was taken. Next slide. So this is my little family back in the day. I'm a huge University of Tennessee fan. So we had an old Miss Lane Kiff Kiffin lover back here earlier, and it was making me crazy. I'm glad she left. Um, <laughs> They, they, they talked about that. They said, you should pray for your enemies. And I used to pray as plain would crash. They said my heart wasn't in the right place. But at any rate, so this is me and my family. We're headed to Knoxville to a football game. That's my son, Heath, my daughter, Haley, and that's me and Karen. Young doctor, I got my whole life ahead of me. What a future, right? It looks great from the outside. What's that? The bulge in my pocket. It's not my wallet. It's not my car keys. It's a bottle of pills. I love that picture, and I hate that picture because I know what's in my pocket. You can pick it out. You can pick addiction out of Brooke's picture laying in the front seat of the car. Can you pick it out of that? Next slide. I love kids. Always have, always will. We go to the beach. There's about 20 of us. Uh, the parents are all underneath the umbrellas drinking, and I'm out in the water with the kids. Now I'm out in the water with their kids, but I'm still out there. And I love them. Uh, these are my two kids, my niece and nephew, as well as my two goddaughters. Uh, four of them are married. Two of them have their own kids now. At the end of a long day at Disney World in October, and I'm shiny. I love that picture, and I hate that picture. I'm shiny because I'm dope sick. Because I had this thing in my background that nobody knew about, and I couldn't tell them. And it damn near took my life. Next slide. Had to get Karen to take this picture down over our mantle a few years ago at Christmas. I walked in and said, honey, can we take that down? It's been hanging up there for a long time. She said, why? I said, because I'm dope sick. We got on a Disney cruise and I ran out of pills. I didn't know at the time the Caribbean doesn't have a DEA. So if you all ever go on a cruise, now I'm going to teach you something. Look and see what's in every port. There'll be T-shirt shops and there'll be souvenir stands and there'll be a pharmacy, guarantee it. And I want you to look at the Americans lined up to go in there because you can get Valium, Xanax, Oxycodone all right off the shelf just like you can Tylenol at Walgreens. And that was the only thing uh, that saved my trip was when I realized that. Next slide. Foundational concepts we've got to look at with regards to addiction. You saw me, you saw Brooke, but I stepped into a system of care that has a 95% success rate, had a six-figure income, I never lost my job. The dean of my medical school, Ron Franks, never, ever missed a paycheck. People we know that get intervened on addiction at their job get fired on the spot. And guys, we've got to change that. People aren't going to step out and get help when they lose everything they got right off the bat. 
So our foundational concepts, addiction is not a moral failure. There's nothing wrong with going to church. There's nothing wrong with helping little old ladies across the street. Nothing wrong at all. Ain't got anything to do with addiction, guys. Addiction is a disease of the brain. It is a hereditary chronic condition that's unbelievably treatable. There are more people living in active recovery in the United States today than there are active addiction. That is a fact, yet we almost never hear of it because of the stigma associated with it. Next, addiction's treatable treatment works, people recover. That's my favorite line. I use it all the time. And then last but not least, addiction's complex and the solution is systemic. So this is what my, myself and, and Dr. Moore and our colleagues on the Abatement Council wrestle with. Next slide. A recovery ecosystem. How do we create a system of care that no matter where you touch that system of care, you get the help that you need. Because I'm telling you right now, it doesn't exist. The care that you get right now is going to be dependent upon the place that you go and the care that they deliver. They may not deliver the care that you need, but you're going to get it anyway. If you're a hammer, everything's a nail, right? Same thing. Right? I heard early on in, in recovery, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Yet we will send a kid uh, to rehab for the 10th time to the same place where they do the same thing they did the previous nine times, and we'll ask the parent to mortgage the house for the third time and, and drain their 401k, and I think it's criminal. I want to know what outcomes are. Call the treatment center and say, hey, my, what, are, what are your outcomes? What can I expect at two years and five years? You're going to get two things. You're going to get crickets or a lie. And that's not fair. All right, Megan Berry, the, our former mayor of Nashville, lost her son Max to a drug overdose. And Megan said, I was the mayor of the city. I had all kinds of resources. I thought if I sent Max away for 28 days and he comes back, he's going to be fine. And it, it eats her up inside to this day as it would. And she's been public with this. It's not me sharing it. She shared it numerous times. And guys, she just didn't, that's not how it works. You don't send somebody away for high blood pressure for 28 days and they come back and they don't need blood. I mean, you just don't. Okay, addiction is treatable, and it's a chronic disease, and we have to get people the treatment that they need. My job is to find your path to recovery. That's it, not the path that I had. One of the problems I see in addiction treatment is the people providing the treatment often have had addiction themselves, and they think the only way to get there is the way that they got there. I used to think that until I got out in the world and everybody didn't get the treatment I got. I stepped into a treatment system that has a 95% success rate. What's the success rate of anybody else? Anybody know? Just walking in. Take all comers. Anybody know? It's around 10. It's around 10. Okay? And those are, those are rough because of the anonymity thing, but it's around 10. And guys, what's the disparity there? It doesn't have anything to do with anything other than resources and what we're willing to put into it with regards to social determinants of health and getting at these underlying drivers with untreated mental illness and chronic trauma. So here's my proposal. So we look at our referral sources on the left. The biggest referral source in the United States for substance use and mental health actually is criminal justice. If we're going to look at the opioid crisis in the United States, uh, we're not going to do anything with it until we address criminal justice. That is a fact, okay? There's too many of them in there, right? 95% of the people in jails and prisons today, guys, will walk the street again. I would rather them walk the street healthy, all right? And so we have to look at getting to them in criminal justice. Treatment providers, counselors, community support groups, self-directed. What's not on that list? Doctors. <laughs> Doctors don't even make the top six. Okay, because we don't teach it in medical school and residency. And so we have to get to our young providers. We have to get to the nursing schools. We have to get to the physician's assistant schools. We have to get to our medical schools in the United States. The, we need questions on the national board exam, okay, so that the schools have to teach it. I go in there now and I say, we need this in our curriculum. So Dr. Lloyd, we don't have room for it in our curriculum. Really? This is the number one health problem in the United States. This is it. If you don't believe me, how many people die of nicotine addiction? It's the number one preventable cause of death in the world. And, and, and I'm going to gripe about this for a second, just to make a point. You don't have room for it in your curriculum. We had an hour on maple syrup urine disease. <laughs> now, I'm, now, I don't want to offend the people out there with maple syrup urine disease. <laughs> right? But we did. We had an hour on it. it. You know why? Because there's a question on the national board exam on it. And it's an inborn error of metabolism. And they want you to know the pathway and know the question they're going to ask you on it. And so when I figured that out, one of my goals and my missions is to get questions on the national board exam on addiction because we got to have medical schools start teaching it. So here's what we got to do with treatment. It's not just you come in, you stay a while, and you leave. It's about physical and mental health. It's about life skills development, employment support, case management, peer support, stable housing. Nobody in this room would look and smell as nice as you do right now if you slept on the street last night. And so we have to have stable housing. 
All right, it is our number one need in Tennessee and most states I work in. And then last but not least is educational support. And the outcome is somebody who's happy, healthy, who has social support, housing, transportation, employment. That's the goal. We have $1.2 billion in the state of Tennessee over the next now 16 years. Okay, we got 16 more years of it if we don't get any more money. So here are some ideas. First of all, I call it pre-treatment. The other word for it for me is survival programs. Uh, and, and the word that most people use is harm reduction. I try to stay away from harm reduction because it has some negative connotations. But I can tell you it's absolutely necessary, and it's necessary for this reason. I haven't figured out how to treat dead people. I don't know how to treat them. If you're alive, I can try to help you. If you're dead, I can't do anything with you. So the number one thing that we have to do is we've got to blanket areas with overdose reversal drugs everywhere. We need overdose reversal drugs in the hands of people who use drugs and the people who hang around people who use drugs, right? It can't be over here at the health department. I love the health department. My patients don't go to the health department. Patients living in the homeless camp across from this Titan Stadium don't go to the health department. We have to get medication in people's hands because it saves lives, guys. Care what you think about it. Had a had a um, had a lady ask me one time. She goes, well, "How many times are you going to do it? How many times would you want me to reverse your kid? That's how many times I'm going to do it. I get that all the time. Oh, we just reverse them and they go right back. Yeah, but they're alive. And every time they draw breath, we get another chance at them. And I'll take a bite at that apple every time. We got to have syringe service programs. That makes people nervous. Oh, you're going to give people crack pipes and needles? No." Guys, we're going, to, we're going to provide things that are clean so that we can try to entice them into treatment, okay? And, and we don't live in a vacuum. You say, well, I'm not an intravenous drug user, and I'm not a male homosexual, so I am not at risk of HIV and hep C. You're living in a dream world. If you have a car wreck and you go to the hospital, and you go to Williamson County uh, Hospital here, uh, you're going to go in, they're going to say you need blood, and they're going to hand you a consent form that's going to tell you your risk of those two things, and your risk on those two things are going to be directly proportional to the viral load in your community. This is everybody, guys. It's not just people in a vacuum. And syringe service programs lower the rates of HIV and hep C's in communities, and we need to be able to responsibly because here's what harm reductionists on the other side do. We're just going to give them what they want until, until they decide to do something different, and I'm telling you that won't work either. Because back in, in 2004, if you said, Steve, we're just going to give you OxyContin until you're ready to do something, I would have died on the street. That is a fact. They said, Steve, we're going, to, we're going to give you what you need right here, but we're also going to get you help. And if you want to keep your medical license, you'll do this. I'm very fond of my medical license. So I decided to listen. Guys, I drove to Nashville, or my dad drove me to Nashville back in 04 for one reason, for me, and that was to save my medical license. That's it. You say you can't force people into treatment. Bull crap. You can. You force me into treatment because I came to save my medical license, and I got recovery, and I got a life I never dreamed of. And I see it happen in jails all the time. You can do that. You do it in a loving way. And these are some tools that we can use to get there. VRLAC. Anybody know what that is? Voluntary Reversible Long-Acting Contraception. If you want to prevent babies from being born drug dependent, then make voluntary reversible long-acting contraception widely available, no barrier. Okay, that's our way to do it, and I think we can. Next slide. Next. We've got to increase access to medications for opioid use disorder, support uh, women during pregnancy and postpartum. The big key for women going home with their child is not the fact that the child was born dependent in the hospital. It's those next 18 years, guys. What kind of household are we going to send them back into? And we need support services for that mom. Single mommies make the world go round. And we need support services to help in the raising of that child. And then we've got to expand our services for babies born with neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, babies being born dope sick. Next one. We've got to improve treatment in our jails and prisons. That is, that is a no-brainer. I work in the state of West Virginia right now. We have treatment behind every jail and prison bar in the state of West Virginia. We do not have it, but about in three jails in the entire state of Tennessee. We're missing the boat on this one, and we've got to have our leaders come around on it, and we've got a governor that believes in this, and so I'm, I'm excited about the possibilities there. We have to, form, uh, we have to fund warm handoffs back into the community. You can't just treat somebody in jail and prison and turn them loose. There's got to be a transition to care back into the community. We've got to have those providers to provide that care. Next one. Yeah, this the, yeah. we have to have enriched prevention strategies. I talk about medication. Guys, I'm a prevention guy and not D.A.R.E. D.A.R.E. didn't work. I'm not mad at D.A.R.E. at all. The heart was in the right place. The heart was in the right place. Kids actually use more drugs. All right, I want to do programs that work, and I'm going to give you one real quick. Fall Hamilton Elementary School, Metro Nashville. 
I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. If you haven't, Google it, put it on YouTube, whatever. Uh, I found out about it several years ago. Their entire curriculum is trauma-based, K through four. Okay, these are kids that are coming out down around the soccer stadium, right? One of the highest incarcerated zip codes in the United States. And I want to talk about me for a second here if I can, because it, it, the day that I went there blew my mind because I'd heard about it and I'd heard how they were treating these kids. And I said, I got to go see that. And so I do like I do. I jumped my car and I drove down there and I learned a few things that day. Number one, you cannot just walk in an elementary school anymore. <laughs> After I got by the guy with the rubber glove, it was, it was easy. And I walked around all day long and every person in that school who touches those kids from the, from the clerical staff to the teachers to the janitor, janitorial staff, they were all trauma informed. These kids are coming out of households where one or both parents are incarcerated. Stephen Lloyd, back in Jonesboro Elementary School in 1974. Y'all have known me for almost an hour now. What kind of student do you think it was? <laughs> I was in trouble all the time. I was the kid the first day of class. My new teacher knew my name on the first day because my new teacher had talked to my old teacher who had already done their time. Right? I was that kid. When I got in trouble... It was corporal punishment. We didn't have classrooms. We had dividers. So they brought me around to the edge where multiple classes could see me get spanked. Corporal punishment. And then when I got home, it was a whole lot worse than that. What was going on in my house? I was being physically and sexually abused. They never saw me cry. I would never let them see me cry. And I'm not mad at it. It's just what it was back then. But that's, that's the difference in approaches. If you want to know who these kids are, ask their teachers. They'll tell you. We know who they are right now. And we have to get to that point that we're intervening because if we don't, in 10 years, these kids are going to be in our system. Back in, back in my day, they used to put us in classes based on how smart we were. And I was always in what we call the dumb classes. Kids know. And I was in seventh grade. It's the first time in Tennessee we took tests and we got to color in those little bubbles. And after we took that test, a teacher came and got me from the dumb class and put me in the smart class. I thought I was smart. What happens to my life if that doesn't happen? Right. And that's my point. All right, how many other kids does that happen to? Guys, I got lucky. Next slide. We got to have transparency, which we do. I'm very proud of that, and I know Dr. Moore is too. We are transparent in all of our processes, and we have to involve people with lived experience. Guys, uh, and, and lived experience can't be just mine. It's got to be other people who've been through this system. Next slide. My life went up and up and up and up. I became the chief of medicine at my hospital. I ran our residency programs. A few years ago, I got a registered letter in the mail. Nothing ever good comes a registered letter. This one actually was. Bill Lee appointed me to the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners. And as of last month, I'm now the president of the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners. Guys, I should be in front of the Tennessee Board of Medical Examiners, not on it. But I'm on it as the president because I'm a turtle on a fence post. And I stepped into a system of care that was designed to put me here. Next slide. What happened to my friend Brooke? Brooke gets put in jail. She withdraws. Somebody with no medical license and no medical training stops her medication, told her she didn't need it. And after 30 days, when she got out, they did not give her a referral to a mental health provider, and they did not give her a referral back to an addiction medicine doctor. On the morning of December 13th, 2020, which was a Sunday, my phone rang early in the morning. I looked down, it was Angie. She said, Steve, I found Brooke cold and blue in her bed this morning. Brooke died of an acute overdose of heroin and fentanyl. You now know one of the 107-622. This is a preventable death. It's a system death. And this is one that we could have, uh, could have prevented. So, okay, she's dead. We don't have to worry about it anymore. Not quite. Who's that on the right? That's Miss Ava. A little pink potty there is Ava is potty training, and she seems to be pleased with whatever has transpired there. Ava's genetics we've already covered. What about her second seven adverse childhood experiences? Mom dead, dad in prison. Her ACE of score is two. ACE of score four, things go up. If we don't do something here, what are the chances this child is in our system in a generation? And I'm telling you, it's damn near 100%. Next slide. My favorite one. It used to be my favorite one. I don't have two slides left. I'm still going to finish on time. I started five minutes late. Uh, that's me and my family in Florence, Italy. Uh, never dreamed as a little boy in Jonesboro. I go to Florence, Italy. That's my son, Heath, my daughter-in-law, Laura. The blonde's my wife, Karen. That's me in the middle. I want to talk about the right. The girl on my right, that's my daughter, Haley. It's where all my money goes. Uh, so uh, I'm a firm believer in the old double standard. When it was time for Heath to go to college, his ass needed to go. 
I told him, I said, it's time to go, son. I love you, but you need to go. And he did. I told Haley, uh, Haley, if you will stay in your bedroom and live in our house, I'll pay for everything until the day you die. And, uh, and she didn't do that. Uh, when she was uh, a junior in high school, she brought that thing on her right home. His name is Sterling. I talked to him for about five minutes. I walked into where Karen was. I said, Karen, I think I just met our son-in-law. And she said, ah, oh, it's her first date. Six years later, I was standing at the end of a long aisle on the dude with the Bible on the other end, and, and Haley's getting married. And we're getting ready to walk down the aisle. She's on my arm. I'm crying. I'm a mess. It was awful. And right before we walked down, she put her head over my shoulder. She said, Daddy, I, I, you're the first man I ever loved. Thank you for everything you ever did for me. Not bad, right? Not bad. I'm a turtle on a fence post. Little girls don't do that to dads that were absent. I wasn't absent. I wasn't perfect. But I was there. I was there for everything. I was told in my academic career, uh, Steve, you'd have been further along in your academic career if you hadn't went to so many ball games. <laughs> I'd pull both fingers out and show you what I wanted to do, but I, I didn't. I'm so proud of that. I was a dad. I was what I needed to be, and I was there because somebody helped me be there. And that's a good moment, but my kids don't know this part. In the program that night, uh, I'm, I'm not in parentheses. I'm Steve Lloyd, May 11th, 1967, Dash. I got to give my daughter away because I didn't die in 2004. Heath got married in the pandemic year. Uh, he played at college baseball, played at Tennessee, got 100 buddies. He came down to the dinner table before he got married. He said, Pops, would you be the best man at my wedding? Guys, the two most important days of my life were those two days. And they were there because in 2004, people like Roland Gray stepped into my life and gave me a path to recovery. People like Ron Franks didn't fire me. People gave me a chance. Students like Andy Russell and Chad Thomas and all those kids when I came back, they didn't care where I'd been. They just loved me being their teacher. And they allowed me to look myself in the mirror again. That's why I wanted to thank Andy today for doing that because it means a lot to me. This used to be my favorite slide. And I used to close with it, but I now have one more. This is my granddaughter, Cecilia. Uh, she just turned one. That was her birth picture. She just turned one. Thank God hey, uh, Heath and his wife have gone to St. Louis for three days. And uh, Karen and I get to keep Cece. So when I get home, uh, Miss Cecilia will be waiting on me. And she just took her first steps yesterday. That is actually no lie. So I want to thank Dr. Moore for putting this together. But what I wanted you all to see is why we're here. This community is uniquely, uh, uniquely positioned uh, to help these folks, right? It's a turtle on a fence post. This community, more than any other that I know, has the things in place to make this happen for a lot of people. It's going to be too late for some. You've already lost too many in this community to this disease. And I want to see that stop. I want to see our money put to things that work. And the things that don't work, I want to see our money move from that to things that do work. And with that said, thank you all.